So we will start. Hello and welcome uh, to the webinar Azure Virtual VAN for everyone. Uh, this is in English because my my fellow MVP, Didier van Houye, is uh, talking about this very interesting topic and Didier showed me a bit of his presentation. It was really interesting. So I thought let's do a webinar about this cool new virtual one but Didier will tell you all about it uh, but before that let me do some marketing because I know Didier and I we always go a little bit longer so I prepared um, some more slides I want um, to give you a, a heads up for the next webinar it's uh, Azure Stack HCI 20H2 with Cosmos Darwin. It's also in English, but I'm very proud that Cosmos, uh, one of the Microsoft PMs, product managers for um, Azure Stack HCI, the new thing that was announced uh, at uh, Inspire, I think two weeks ago. It was two weeks ago, roughly. Yeah, time goes fast, yeah. Yeah, time goes fast, really. And uh, um, Cosmos is uh, doing a webinar here on uh, Friday, the 21st of August, but because we have the nine hour time shift to uh, Seattle time or Redmond time, he is doing it late uh, Thursday evening at 11, uh, 11 p.m. And this this is 8 uh, a.m. Uh, European uh, standard time. So I hope we have a lot of attendees because um, the presentation from Cosmos was only available for partners as far as I know because I didn't find it and he will tell us uh, all about the new Azure Stack HCI 20H2. I hope you will join us there if you are uh, still interested in on-premises. And the good thing is Azure Stack HCI 20H2 will be built over Azure. So it's already a hybrid solution. So then I want uh, to announce uh, that uh, we will start the trainings again um, for the people um, who doesn't know, I do trainings here in the, the nice village of Hallenberg where I live. Uh, so we have a nice training center here. And I do a Hyper-V uh, course and uh, Storage Basis Direct course. And the next uh, Hyper-V course is end of August, so the 31st of August to the 4th of September. And it is a hybrid course. So if you don't want to come to Hallenberg because of the pandemic, you can uh, participate uh, online at the course. And I have a course special, so a webinar special. If you write me that you are interested in Hyper-V and uh, you learned about this in this webinar, send me a mail and you get a special price. So, and um, the question and answers, um, Didier will present. So we will switch the screen very soon. And if you have questions, please type them in the question section in English or in German, it doesn't matter. I will translate the German questions to uh, Didier. So we will find uh, points in the presentation where, where I ask the questions, your questions, and Didier will answer them. So without further ado, let's switch to Didier's screen. So we will do that now. So Didier, the stage is you. It's still black. <laughs> now we see it. So go on, Didier. Didier, have you muted your microphone again, my friend? Of course. Okay. <laughs> yes. So we'll be talking about Azure Virtual One, but if you don't know who I am yet, well, I'm working hard on IT. That's what most people know me by. You can find everything I've ever done or have received as an award in my life on the screen, as well as my credentials where you can reach me afterwards. So let's dive in. So when you talk about cloud, uh, being an MVP, we're going to talk about the nice Azure cloud, right? So this is the Azure cloud uh, above Bryce Canyon. And why is that in here, actually? That has a meaning, because normally I should be on a plane across the ocean, renting a car and visiting all these nice places. But unfortunately, something happened this year. Some little virus came along, and it all got canceled. So I'm stuck here in the summer and I started doing some uh, new stuff in Azure Networking. Uh, virtual One is what I was diving into and let's talk about it. What is it? Why would you use it? And where are we at with this technology? 
Well, the technology is pretty recent, uh, but before we talk about it, you cannot talk about Azure Virtual One without mentioning Microsoft's global network. So the most important thing on this picture is the fact that it really is a global network and that they have enormous amounts of bandwidth. Uh, you can see some stats here, submarine cables of 160 terabits per second, 1.6 petabits per second uh, inter-data center within a region uh, capabilities. But the other thing that's very important is, is all these edges and regions, these points of presence. Microsoft has a lot of places spread out across the globe where you can get into the Azure Global Network as soon as possible. And that really makes a difference because there's these guys from a thousand eyes, they give a, a cloud performance uh, analysis every year and Microsoft comes out very well because wherever you are in the world, whether it's in Europe, uh, the Americas, Asia, you always get to the Microsoft backbone very fast. If you're in Italy, you get to the backbone in Italy. You don't have to go across the world uh, to go to India, for example. You you go as fast as possible. And with some providers, you have to make a little detour. And that brings latency and delays with, with it, right? So that's what it's, what's important about that uh, backbone network from Microsoft. So what is Azure Virtual One? Well, basically, it is a global networking service. Uh, that went GA only last year. And it allows you to very easily leverage that Azure network to build your own private high-speed global transit network over the world. So you can actually piggyback on it. That's basically what you do. Now, that network itself, you can actually connect to your on-premise environment, and you could even use it to interconnect your, your different uh, sites, your data centers, your, your offices, or even your uh, telecommuters and road warriors. So that's kind of cool. But you could say, wait a minute, DJ, we can already do that. We have that already. And that's true. But there's a, a difference, of course. This is a very small uh, representation of an Azure Virtual WAN. And what it offers you is centralized and easy to manage, uh, transitive VNet to VNet, branch to VNet, and branch to branch connectivity. So the fact that you have a single plane of glass, a control plane to, to manage it all, uh, it's a lot easier than it used to be. All the manual pairing, you don't have to do it anymore if you don't want to. Uh, and it's transitive, which means that you can get from point E to B to Z all over the place. It's a full mesh, which is quite impressive because you don't really have to do anything for that. It happens automatically, so to speak. Uh, to connect your on-premises infrastructure or your mobile users, you could use site-to-site -site VPNs, point-to-site VPNs, or express route. So that's all available. It now, since uh, I think uh, very July the 1st, it integrates with Azure Firewall Manager, so you can configure an Azure Firewall. And there's something to say about that as well. We'll, we'll get into that. Uh, they have a lot of partners that are signing up to use this technology or that network to help you uh, integrate your uh, on-site on uh, locations into the Azure Virtual WAN. And we'll have a quick look at some of those uh, offerings. And very new to the, to the game is custom routing. That went, I think, live around uh, Inspire. So that's two weeks ago, as Karsten mentioned. So let's go through the basics. And an Azure Virtual One, as we said, that's a global service. That's your management plane, so to speak. But the real heart of a, of a virtual WAN is a virtual WAN hub. That's the connection point where it all ties in. That's where you will uh, connect your on-premises locations and where you will connect your VNets. So you have to place them in a bit of an intelligent way based on where are my data centers, where are my offices, where are my users, and where do I run my Azure workloads, right? The hubs are really the axis of the wheel where the, all the spokes connect and which will help you make it easy and transitive uh, to build a network. So the virtual one hub, very important, that's the core. And if you draw the picture again, if you look at your Azure Virtual One, even if you have only one Virtual One hub, because you can have one per region, there will always be one. So what do you do? You connect your VNets to the hub. You connect your data center or headquarters via express routes. You could use site-to-site -site VPNs or express route to connect offices or point-to-site VPNs for mobile devices. 
and it all comes together here and it's all transitive. But you also have to think a bit outside of the Microsoft world because once you have connectivity to a hub, there's nothing that would stop you to do a site-to-site -side VPN to AWS or even use Azure Express Route with Direct Connect from Azure, uh, from AWS, sorry, uh, with, a, with a telco that offers you the service to connect the two together. And then keep going along that path, you can hook up uh, Google Cloud, Alibaba, or a managed service provider's private cloud that is run for you by a partner. It's all possible. Now, the virtual one, as we said, that's your control plane, right? Of that globally distributed network. But in there, we have the resources that are important. We already mentioned that that one hub is the regional core of virtual one. So that's, that's a given. That's where all the connectivity to the VNets and uh, the users, the data centers, the offices happen. You have one per region. That's important. Uh, if you need more per region, you would deploy multiple virtual ones, but that's a whole other discussion. Chances are you're not going to need that. What does it do? What, where's the magic sauce? Well, when it comes to the, the transit aspect of this story is, and we'll have a picture about that, all the manual pairing you needed to do, all the routing, the firewall configuration, the virtual net, network gateways you had to set up to make it a completely uh, transitive network in Azure uh, until now, until we had Azure Virtual One, that's being replaced by this concept. And it's all done automatically. So that saves a lot of time. Uh, and just like uh, a network gateway, it has an address space, but it's all created for you during uh, the setup and all the routing for you is taken care of. So it's a time saver and it's a lot easier. And it also makes your architectures easier. So when, you, when it comes to connecting things to the hub, well, you, you mentioned them already. You have the site-to-site the -site option. You have the user VPN configurations. That means the, the point-to-site VPNs. And you have Express Route, right? That's also on, the, on the, the page. And finally, not forget Azure itself. The virtual network connections are also very important in this story. Now, what's more, as we said, you can have one hub per virtual re region but you have multiple hubs in a virtual WAN and they are connected or you can connect them at least between hub to hub, which means that this entire game becomes global, right? If you have one region, second region, these could be in the same continent like West Europe and North Europe, but they could be in the Americas, in Asia, in Africa. And you can all interlink them all over that Microsoft uh, global network. Uh, another very important aspect of all this is the hub route tables. That's the construct that they use to route all the data that you want to send all over the place. And you can either populate these uh, manually, static routes, or you can also use dynamic uh, routing with BGP, for example. And of course, dynamic routing with BGP is the way to go. Now, uh, another component in there is the VPN site uh, and we'll we'll talk about the little components a bit more uh, just after this one but what's important about the VPN site is the concept of a link and a link is actually one connection to a known site uh, location and a link is always active active so it has two tunnels that's important for the failover but it's also good to know that you can have multiple links up to four and that gives you failover auto paths selection redundancy bandwidth aggregation all that good stuff uh, but before we dive into this and uh, the, the capabilities of all the connectivity features we want to mention that there are two types of azure virtual wan there's a basic edition which only does site-to-site uh, -site vpn so you can connect your branch to azure your azure to branch your branch to branch but when you connect your VNets, you will have to do the pairing yourself. And the hubs themselves are also not connected. So this is like, why would you use this? Well, basically, if you want to buy, uh, sorry, if you want to build an SD-WAN solution, but you want to leverage Microsoft's global network, this could be your option because you don't need as much of the other features potentially. And the difference between what you do now with site-to-site uh, -side VPNs is the scale. And we'll mention that uh, a bit later. 
But one of the bigger successes, I think, of Azure Virtual One will be the standard version because that's everything that BASIC offers, but you have the full mesh. That means that all the hubs within one single Virtual One are connected. But you can also leverage Express Route. You can leverage a user VPN, the point-to-site VPN, which is important because a user VPN in this scenario is fully uh, capable of acting like a branch. You can connect from anywhere to anywhere, so that means from a user to a data center, from a user to an office, from a user to a telecommuter with, with a VPN uh, device at home. It, it's really any to any. And again, the scale here is a lot bigger than what you are used to with the current uh, VPN solutions. Did you, I have a question here. Apps. Yes. If that's okay. Go ahead. So um, Trevor is asking if there's a virtual one hub per region, does that mean per Azure network edge point? And to clarify, for example, Azure only has a single region in Australia, but multiple Azure edge points. Is that only one VVAN hub for all of Australia? As far as I know, the hub exists in the region. But where you connect into the Azure network will be determined by your internet provider where they where they hook up into where Microsoft allows them to to come in. Yeah, into the edge. Yeah, I think Trevor yeah. wants to use it maybe in Australia to go into one edge and go, uh, dropping out on another edge. Maybe Trevor, maybe you can I think that should be possible. I think that should be possible. Yeah. Okay. I, we will yeah. come back to this question. Go on with your yeah. uh, uh, with your presentation, please. So side-to-side -side VPNs, we already mentioned this. Uh, what's important about this? Well, the multi-link support, we saw that in detail. It's good to know that if you do multi-link support, you might also want redundant uh, VPN solutions or devices at, uh, at your place. But what you can do is you can dynamically distribute your traffic. So you can determine, depending on the vendor you choose to do this, uh, what is the optimal path to take? What is the latency on one of the links? Uh, where do I need to go? What's optimal? So that you can choose. Uh, so that's interesting. Of course, you always have to build multiple links if you're smart with multiple ISPs if you want some uh, a bit of redundancy in there. Uh, the redundancy is also a nice thing to have because you have automatic path failover in case one of your ISP dies. Uh, the reliability becomes bigger because if one dies, well, you don't have suffered downtime and you have the possibility of some cost reduction because the moment you can have two ISPs, you might think, hey, I can get rid of my MPLS uh, lines or other lines and go solely over the internet. That's an option you have. And then scale-wise, if you look at it, you can now have up to 20 gigabits per uh, throughput for the VPNs and, and it scales in units of 500 megabits so you, you that's where you start and you end up with 20 maximum but that's significant that's that's double what you used to have and there's also a lot of more tunnels you can have uh, I think 2,000 connections and one 2,000 tunnels in total so that's a pretty big improvement over what you used to have and actually this one comes with standards so if it is your aim to just use this as a let's say some sort of a connectivity network for an SD-WAN solution, well, that's the way to go. Well, well, look, it's on there, the connections. So the point to site, also very interesting, especially in these times where everybody seems to be telecommuting as much as possible for some reason. Uh, and that's, I think, only going to increase and never going to go away anymore. Uh, this only comes in standard virtual one. It's important to know. What's nice here is the scale. So up to 20 gigabits for this as well. That's on top of the 20 gigabits you get with site to site and up to 10,000 users per hub, which is also a nice number. Uh, your cloud-based secure remote access is kind of uh, a big deal because you can use OpenVPN, which is an SSL VPN or an IKV2 client. You have third-based and radius authentication. That's an option you can have. and uh, don't forget, anything you connect to Azure Virtual One, and that includes the point to site, so the user VPNs play a role in that any to any. So you can really connect to anywhere in the world over that user VPN, which is quite nice. Uh, and uh, you can use it to go to another site of your company on premises, or you can use it to go to Azure. And it's always in both directions. So you have full 
connectivity. And I will stress this a few times because this is really cool. Uh, monitoring, yes, of course you can do that and it's just tied up into the metrics you have in Azure. If you have a data center or you are a very large company, you're interested in Express Route, again, only in the standard edition, of course, uh, the scale goes up to 20 gigabits and here the scale unit is 2 gigabits per second. Uh, what's important to know is that your connectivity here, you will require a premium circuit and global reach because the global reach with Express Route is how you get that any-to-any -any connectivity all over the globe. So these two you need to have to make it work. Uh, the cool thing is, of course, that as we said for the user VPN, also goes for the Express Route VPN. You can connect from a site-to-site -site VPN to Express Route, you can go from Express Route to a user VPN, etc., etc. So the connectivity really is all over the place. Uh, there is, of course, one thing that we should mention. Uh, the moment you have two locations that are connected over Express Route, uh, normally the traffic would go over the hub, but if you have an Express Route circuit that can take care of it, it's intelligent enough to notice and it will use that. So you're not gonna do stupid things or use a suboptimal path. Again, monitoring, it's integrated with met metrics in, and resource health, uh, capabilities you already have in Azure. So no need to worry about that. But why would you use it, right? Well, we've stressed about everything we like about it. Uh, let's dive into this. Well, this is a picture of the traditional approach if you wanted to build something a bit more uh, global or even within regions. How do you do it? Well, you're going to have your subscriptions with your VNets in different regions all over the world and what you're going to have to do is you're going to create a construct that is basically a transit VNet and that transit VNet will have either or both uh, VPN gateways, express route gateways and that's what you will use in the hop and spoke architecture to do the pairing from your VNets so they have connectivity over here and you can pair them between each other and in that way you basically build your own hub and spoke architecture and you go to on-premise over your VPN, your site-to-site -site VPN, a user VPN or express route. That's how you did it before virtual one came along. There is one big thing you need to realize about this. This is not transitive at all by default, which means that you have to do all the, uh, the work to make this uh, transitive uh, yourself, either by pairing the VNets amongst each other or deploying an NVA in the transit VNet to make, to make that routing happen. So for a couple of VNets, that isn't too much work and not too complex, but as your environment grows, uh, that adds up, especially because normally uh, there are people that have one subscription with a couple of VNets, but a lot of people have subscriptions with multiple VNets, or people sometimes have hundreds of subscriptions, uh, depending on how you organize Azure, and you don't need to be a Fortune 500 company to have a couple of hundred uh, Azure subscriptions. Uh, so then it becomes a bit tedious to manage. So what if we can replace this by Azure Virtual One? You do your deployment of, your, of that uh, Azure Virtual One with a hub in every region, and every VNet you pair to that hub automatically has all the routing configured transitively so no need to worry about having to set up pairing or NVAs to go from a VNet uh, in the west of the US to one in Western Europe. It's all taken care of you automatically to this hub mesh, so to speak, which is cool. And of course, the same goes for the connectivity to the branch. So this is really nice. And uh, the moment you start playing with it and see it in action, it's a bit scary because there's a lot of connectivity all of a sudden automatically. So, what does this give you? Operational efficiency and scalability, because we already said the scale is quite impressive, we've seen the numbers, but operational efficiencies mean cost reduction, right? It's uh, just easier to use. Uh, so you replace the transit VNets with the virtual one hubs. You could even, if you go for, let's say, uh, a migration from an existing environment, you can integrate both of them together and move step by step, that's, that's, uh, that's okay. But in general, your network design and your routing architecture will be simpler. And that translates in operational cost reductions because you have ease of use uh, and you can automate a lot. And automation is 
things you can do in Azure yourself, but there's also all the third-party appliances and the managed service providers that will offer you services to do it for you or appliances that can uh, create the connectivity you need uh, in Azure for you. And I have some screenshot, screenshots about some tests I did with that, which is quite nice to see. Uh, again, we've mentioned this, the scale has increased, right, for the site-to-site -side VPNs and the point-to-site VPNs, so from 10 gigabit to 20 gigabit, but that is for both. So you already had 40 gigs with just VPN. Remember, we have now 10,000 users per hub, which you, I think you already had with the most expensive uh, point-to-site VPNs, but the 1,000 uh, site-to-site connections per hub, that's pretty impressive. That's, uh, that's a humongous increase, actually. And on top of that, don't forget, if you take Express Round into the mix, that's another 20 gigs you can have, so that's already 60 gigabits per second per region. Nice. Uh, and the redundancy and the high availability is all taken care of for you. So you don't need to worry if you, today you deploy a, a, a VPN gateway, for example, or you have to make sure that, hey, uh, I need to make it high available, so I need zone redundancy, et cetera, et cetera. This is taken care of. It just does it for you also behind the scenes. We've already mentioned this uh, a bit too much perhaps for some people, but the any to any is really the crux here of, of, of the solution. Uh, so all the routing, as we said, is going over that virtual WAN hub and any VNet that is paired to that hub will automatically update the routing table of that hub and will be able to reach uh, all other VNets in the solution and the branches in the solution. And when I say branches, you should always think express route, site-to-site -site VPN, and user VPN. So all that configuration and messing around, uh, it's gone. You don't need to do it anymore. And as we mentioned, the hub-to-hub -hub interconnectivity makes that you can connect every, every site and every VNet in the world within your Azure Virtual WAN to each other. So that's the cool thing there. And again, we've already mentioned this, Express Route Premium and Global Reach. Uh, if you have those and you need those for a virtual one, they will bypass the hub if it's between two, two locations that have this capability because that just makes sense. So if you look at it, this is a virtual one deployment over three regions with multiple VNets across regions and uh, a presence in three regions with headquarters, data centers, branch offices, and mobile users. So what do we have? The full mesh is because the hubs uh, interconnect over Microsoft's global network. And then you can have branch to Azure either over a site-to-site -site VPN, over that point-to-site VPN, or over Express Route. And note that you can go over a region to a VNet in another region or a VNet in your own region. It doesn't matter. It is full mesh, any to any. What you can also do is branch to branch, but you can go branch to branch over express route to VPN, over end user to site to site VPN, end user to express route VPN. Again, any to any, it's all in there. So whatever you want to do, and I can't draw them all because the picture would become unusable, but it's possible. And then last but not least, of course, you have the VNet to VNet within a region or across regions, all taken care of you, all the, the, the pairing, the routing is done automatically the moment you connect uh, a virtual net work to that hub. And that's what they mean with the any to any, the benefits, simplified network, ease of use, and operational savings. And that's what Microsoft calls a global transit architecture with Azure Virtual One. They always come up with very nice long names for some reason, but that's how they describe it. Uh, Didier, now, what do we Didier? have today? Yes. I have a question. Yes. Can you go back, please? <laughs> yes. So maybe this is stupid, but um, when you create a VNet, usually you uh, get the 10, 10, 10, 0 subnet or 10, 10, 0, 0. A network yes. and I assumed sometimes the VNets use the same subnet. So what is if you want to connect a VNet with this uh, a private subnet to another VNet with a private subnet? Ah, Will that routing, work? Routing, rule, routing rules apply. You need to make sure that you don't okay. uh, overlap your, your networks. Okay. It's, it's kind of hard it's kind of hard to to route 
to the same subnet. So there is still some planning involved so that you don't use the same subnet. There is most the certainly still some planning involved. It is, it's, we, I would call it automatically, uh, it does automatically a lot of nice things for you. Yeah. But of course, it isn't really a wizard that can make uh, the laws of, uh, let's say, IT or, or, or nature go away for you. OK, OK. So it's good, maybe in, not, maybe in version two. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> maybe in version two. Good. But the state of the union, what do we have? So today, any to any connectivity, we've beaten that to death by now. Express route, point to site and site to site for connectivity to branches. You have express route encryption. This is something that people really like because if you send things over express route, you would like to encrypt them, you can. You have the hub connectivity, right, for the full mesh, which makes it really a global construct. Uh, the multi-link Azure path selection, remember for the redundancy, the auto path selection, the optimization, the failover at your uh, on-premises sites. You can do custom IPsec. Some customers seem to find this very important that they can do this. It helps uh, those people out. You can also connect existing virtual network gateway VPNs to your Azure virtual one. So if you want to deploy this, you don't have to change everything in one day. You can just start with it, build it out, and connect your existing environments to it, and slowly but surely you know, migrate over or not, if that's the case. Uh, very recently, uh, in July 1st, I think, it became GA, Azure Firewall Manager. So now it integrates with uh, Azure Firewall via firewall policies, which means that you have integrated security into the solution, which is also kind of cool. And it's available in the government cloud in China, which is important to US customers and Chinese customers. And last but not least, one of my favorites at the moment, the custom route tables. Actually, they should, in the week of the 3rd of August, they state on their website and in your uh, Azure portal, uh, that should be finished. Uh, and it's a nifty capability to create a lot of scenarios, and we'll actually look at some of those. And of course, don't forget all the partners we mentioned. Uh, I think a couple of days ago, they announced that you can now also use an NVA from your vendor in the hub itself. So now the automation from a vendor can be 100% almost because you have the smart, let's say, appliances on premises, but now you can have the appliance in the hub, which take care of all the connectivity and all the features and enhancement they might want to offer. So that's brand new uh, and it's uh, in GA. So sorry, it's in, in preview. That one is in preview. Did you have a question so from the audience? It. Sure. Um, what is with IPv6, v6, is it supported? Uh, if I recall, yes. And uh, then we are, were talking about the address conflicts. Uh, Trevor was asking, wouldn't native IPv6 v6 network uh, obviate these routing conflicts? I don't think so, but uh, maybe you have some other insight. Ooh. The thing there is that uh, with IPv6, I, I see so little of it in real life, Yeah. Uh, even in places where it matters even more than in Azure, that I, it's there, I think you can use it, but in reality, I've never, and this is just me outing myself, but I've never even had to deploy IPv6 for real in, in my entire career. So, so something to learn. That may <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe that I've learned it a couple of years ago and I've probably forgotten all about it because I never use it. It's a, it's a bit of the things that everybody seems to know we need to move there and that's where the future is. But then there is the real world where I see that 99.9% .9 of things get done with IPv4, especially in, in smaller and medium enterprises and on-premises. Mm. Uh, I'm pretty sure there is a lot of IPv6 going on with the, with, the, with the telcos and the internet providers and the cloud players, but from a practical perspective, I, I'm just not confronted with that that much. So okay, thanks. Uh, maybe that. Should, um, yeah. So let's look at Barracuda, which I have been playing with. And if you open up the the console, you can navigate to uh, the cloud integration and you will see you find Azure in there, AWS, and the one we're interested in is Azure Virtual One. And then you can create uh, a connection and you have to fill out uh, the name of your Virtual One and what resource group it's, it's at. Uh, 
the subscription ID, of course, the tenant ID, the client ID, and the client password. This is basically a, a service principle you have to create for the appliances to use to set up the connection in Azure for you. You have to tell it to watch to which uh, virtual hub you want to go and if you want to activate it and then you click apply and if you have a little bit of patience and everything is going well you will actually see your site come up with your uh, link and the link as we said has two active active tunnels and that was all done for me automatically I really did not have to do anything so with another vendor that does not have this integration you have to create the the VPN connections, the both instances manually, take care of the uh, IKV1, the IKV2, uh, you have to set it all up, uh, you have to set it up uh, on the side of Azure. And here, actually, I just point it via this menu to where to where I need to go, I give it the credential it, it needs, and it's all created for me. So if you have larger deployments, this becomes very interesting. And as mentioned just now, uh, it just went in preview that you could uh, also have an appliance in the hub itself to make this even more transparent uh, for you. So I think Barracuda is the is the one example I know of that can do this now. Uh, I, I'm, I presume more will follow, but this is the one I know of. And this is also the one I got into my hands to play with a little. So that's kind of cool to see. And of course, you can do this yourself, or you can have some service partner manage all that for you if you want to. This kind of cool technology to play with. So, because I mentioned Barracuda, I thought I should mention all the rest. So here's the slide with all the vendors that they have right now. Uh, these are the the people that are providing the services. So if you don't want to do all the networking yourself, you can find a partner to do it for you. And as said, the the latest new thingy we have is deploying an NVA in the virtual one hub itself. And there's a link to that announcement and documentation about it. So now. If you look at the, the Ignite demos and the Ignite uh, customer references, uh, they normally are about reasonably sized companies beyond the size for that, than that what I work in normally, that what I know. Uh, many of us work in, or do not work for the Fortune 500 global multinationals where there, we are a bit more modest sometimes in our scale, but we have needs as well. And basically, the benefits for those are the same as for multinationals, except for perhaps that the, the scale you can get to isn't that important to you. But as a way of future-proofing your designs and making it more easy and cheaper uh, and uh, just more practical to build out your Azure environment, this is the way to go, in my opinion. Uh, and if you are a medium and small enterprise, uh, there's this truth. You know, They always say you have to design for failure. And whether it's AWS or uh, Azure, uh, they always say, well, you have to have separate regions because if one region has an issue and you have downtime, you only have yourself to blame. Now, not everybody does this, but maybe you should. But the moment you have two regions, you can leverage that hub-to-hub -hub connectivity to make it really any-to-any -any, uh, in, its, in its architecture and construct. And then, hey, life becomes easier as well when you have to manage two subscriptions, uh, regions, I'm sorry. So let's uh, look at a couple of examples. Uh, maybe for the, uh, the Australian people, uh, if you want to leverage the Microsoft network as an SD-WAN carrier, you can. Because in this picture, there's no Azure resource anywhere. Basically, you just have Azure for the virtual one with two regions in Europe. And you have a factory here somewhere, you have a data center in co-location, you have an office, some road warriors, telecommuters with a user VPN, some people who work at home with their own little private uh, VPN device, some stores where you sell stuff. But basically they are all interconnected and they can all talk to each other. So from North Europe to West Europe, from the data center to the factory, all over Azure. So basically, you are just leveraging Azure's global network as the, the carrier for your SD-WAN solution, right? So it's a force multiplier. Instead of relying on multiple uh, telcos and different lines, you just remember that global network with all the punch of presence and the edges that Microsoft has. You hop onto their network as fast as possible, and from there, it's all Microsoft's responsibility. And it's a vast, well-managed network, so why not leverage it, right? 
this could be your only goal, but it could also be the stepping stone to moving parts of your workloads to Azure. So if you take the same picture and you start using Azure and creating some spokes, well, because you have the connectivity already and it's all transitive and any to any, you're good to go which is a nice thing to have. And even if your on-premise environment is reduced over the coming years, uh, it still keeps working. And maybe you will have no more dedicated uh, Coloco data center, but you will have a server room with an Azure Stack HCI, and you might have Azure Stack Edge in your factory and tie it all together. But if you can, start using virtual one for your new deployments and think about how you can leverage this in your existing deployments because this in my opinion as i said already is the way to go forward so now that you know what azure virtual one is and why i like it so much uh, we can talk about some other things and we'll mainly talk about two things that's firewall manager and the firewall policies and then about uh, the routing so when you have such a nice global transitive Azure Virtual WAN, you have to consider security because sooner or later you're going to meet your security officer and he's going to like, what? You connected everything in the world to everything in the world. And while you might be very happy with it, that, with that they normally are not so enthusiastic about that concept. So you have a firewall at your data centers, at your branch offices. You have probably a firewall at, at smaller locations like shops or even your home. And you even have a firewall on your client devices, right? So why would you not uh, have a need for a firewall in that hub where, where everything passes by? Well, actually you do, so now that's possible. Uh, and basically, the moment you attach a firewall policy to a virtual hub, it becomes a secured virtual hub. And a secured virtual hub is nothing more than that. And for that to be able to be used, you need a firewall manager to become available, which it has. And it provides you with uh, security services in your hub. So you can have protection against things you don't want. You can monitor the network. You can have governance. Uh, that could be Azure's firewall, but it could also be a security service from a third party uh, provider. So whatever scenario you choose or want to go, it's possible. Uh, and once you have a secured virtual hub, it's a bit like the examples we had for uh, the, the SMEs, what can you use it for? Well, if you are, let's say, if you don't have any on-premises connectivity needs, it's okay, you can use it like that, and it will provide you with a lot of uh, automated routing. You can get rid of a lot of the user-defined routings you needed uh, in the past to go to the firewall. Well, not always, but there is reduction in complexity and tediousness in configuration, let's put it that way. And then there's the, 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 the hybrid scenario where it becomes the security part in that complete virtual one architecture where you don't, just have the any-to-any -any connectivity with all the benefits and the ease of use, but you also now can say, hey, these workloads, these use cases, these spots I want to protect via a firewall or a third party, and you can just do, do that. So if you look at the, the Azure portable at, uh, portal at Firewall Manager, you will see that you can use it in uh, as a secured virtual hub and with a hub virtual network. The secured virtual hub is when you use it with an Azure WAN virtual hub, and a hub virtual network is when you use it with your standard normal VNets. But Firewall Manager is basically the management plane. Where, where, where the firewall rules live is in Azure Firewall policies. That's actually the resource. And the firewall has become just the, the execution mechanism. So you attach policies to a firewall with your Firewall Manager, and then you get your protection. And instead of using uh, Azure Firewall as set, you can use your uh, third-party providers. So if you look at it in a, in a drawing, you have some admin at the top who can define policies, what they call global policies, and you can assign them to an Azure Firewall. In our case, with Virtual One, you get a secured virtual hub in that case. But you can also choose to use third parties and it just becomes an integrated part of that virtual one construct. You also can have local admins that uh, create local policies, and this is 
something they do to enable the DevOp principle, right? If you have if you have to have all your firewall needs managed centrally, that become that becomes a bit tedious or let's say too slow, too, it causes too many delays, too many friction, too too long lines of communication. So that's what they are using that for. So if you think about the any to any and the hub to hub, right? With, with, with Azure Firewall Manager, the only thing we replaced in this picture, basically, is the fact that the hub now has a firewall. And with the Firewall Manager, you can create policies and assign these to multiple firewalls. So whether it's two or 15, it's okay, you can do that. And it works against subscriptions, regions, it's all over the place. So it's a global construct as well. And as we said, it's policy driven. And that policy-driven part is important because it, it separates the policies from the actual execution of those policies. Uh, so a firewall policy, if you know something about Azure Firewall, you know it has net rules, it has network and application rules collections, and it has the threat intelligence settings you can configure. And you can do this in the portal via REST APIs, PowerShell, Azure CLI, ARM templates, whatever you like, you, can, you, you just pick your, your choice and you go with it. And I said it's a global resource, so you can use it across multiple firewalls. You can use it to create the secured virtual hub with Azure Virtual One or the normal virtual networks, and they work across the policies and regions, just just like that. And it's 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 a nice idea that you that you get this centralized way of managing your security. But as we said, with that global admin and that local admin, the, the policies are hierarchical, so to speak. So you have a global policies and local policies, which means that with Firewall Manager, you can create a policy that you just put out there and that has to be, uh, let's say, followed or, or assigned to the firewalls globally for everybody. But then you could have local firewall policies by the DevOps teams that uh, provide self-service for them. So they can work uh, faster and more uh, easily than with, with, without ever having to go to that global policy management team that says, hey, can you change this or that for me? So that makes life for them a bit easier. And this is a bit the concept, right? Let's say that you have Azure Firewall Manager with your global admin. It pushes the policies that everybody needs to adhere to that are mandated by, by, the, by the company. But then the local admin, for example, in the in the dev hub, VNet, can assign local policies during development. And once they're happy with what they're doing and they know what they need, they can ask the global admin to push these to staging and production because normally they can't touch those, but they can do their own job a lot easier. So that's the, the principle behind that. Uh, the integration with the third party uh, security services I don't have too much time to talk about that there's a lot of things that you can combine or not combine why and where, when it's used but in general you could look at it like this you can have your Azure firewall in the secured virtual hub in your VRAN and things work as normal from a perspective of the branches or so the data centers the users the, the, the sites and you go to your PaaS services, that's all pretty transparent, or your IIS services, your VNets, it all works. But of course, sometimes you have uh, deployments like software as a service, uh, VDI deployments that need a bit more, let's say, specialized uh, rules, they need to be user aware, and then there are some third parties that offer solutions for that. And that's where this comes in. And still, uh, if you have intelligent partner appliances, you can still use your direct internet breakout to go to Office 365, because none of these pathways, whether it is to, to your secured virtual hub or via your uh, service providers, doesn't make sense if you want to go to Office 365. So the old rule of having a, a direct internet breakout for Office 365 still applies. But there's this, you can do an entire session just, just on this stuff but this is just to, to give you a pointer that there is a lot more to it. And then one of my favorite parts actually is custom routing. Custom routing is uh, being rolled out and it should be finished in the week of August the 3rd. So I checked this morning and I still couldn't do everything I wanted to do, but I hope by the end of the week that will be true and I can start playing with it a bit more. 
but custom routing of course is uh, something that you need if you want to uh, manage your traffic flows a bit better so you want to set up custom route tables for your vnets and by doing so this gives you a lot of flexibility and to, de to determine where who can go where and how they can go somewhere uh, so that's important remember custom routes are only for the vnets not for the branches then there's the concept of association and propagation association basically means that if I associate uh, with uh, a route table that means that I will that's that the routes that are in that table is the ones that I know if I propagate your route table that's what I put in there so that's the subnet and the next hop to get there so association is this is the one I will use for my own routing needs and propagation is this is what I tell others about the routes that are available then there's the cost the, the concept of labels labels is important because think about it the virtual one hop we talked about is that central construct within a region but you can have multiple regions so how does that work well with labels you could see that the default route table has a label default so if you if you associate or propagate to that label it automatically goes to all the uh, route tables of all the hubs and that's what gives you the auto magically updating of the route tables all over the globe right across those regions that's due to these labels and you can create use labels yourself uh, and of course you can again integrate this with net network virtual appliances firewalls routers network load balancers or other shared services that third parties might provide for all kinds of needs now this is a bit uh, abstract uh, if you haven't uh, seen it yet and the Microsoft documentation that's online for the moment isn't too great uh, basically they, they give you something like this so you have an, an Azure virtual one with two hubs and there is connectivity and they say look this is the, the routing configuration for the branches that's associated with the default route table and it propagates to the default route table and for the vnets is the same deal associated with the default route table and propagated to the default route table so this is what you get by default and everybody can talk to everybody that's basically it okay now let's go to another scenario let's say that you want the vnets to be able to talk to the branches and the branches to talk to the vnets any to any in that respect but you do not want any of these vnets to be able to talk to each other so they can go like this over the over the hub in region one to the hub in region two to some site in region two but they cannot absolutely talk to each other so what do you do you create a custom vnet a route table and then you say hey propagate to the default table and then you create a uh, sorry then you still have your default route table and what do you have there well the defaults and you say hey the content of this table propagates over here and that's how you can create this isolation but that's 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 not really explaining a lot so let's let's walk you through this so again the branches can talk to the branches in both directions the branches can talk to the vnets in both directions but the vnets shouldn't shouldn't talk to each other so how do you achieve this remember the concept of association and propagation so we have our default route table when it comes to our branches we will associate the branches in every region with that table right that's what you get by default they will also propagate their routes into that table so that's how in Azure they will know how to get to your local on-premises environments and you do this again for both regions so that's in this table there we are at. at this moment the branches can already talk to each other right because this is the routing table they all know the routes and the, and the, the hops where they need to go to get anywhere on premises cool now what we're gonna do is let's create a custom table that table is empty but what we're going to do is we're going to associate all those vnets with that custom uh, table so in one region and in the second region still this table is empty 
Now, what do we do? We say to a default route table, propagate everything you need to know to route to the VNets. Propagate that to the default route table. Why? Because then, at this moment, the branches know how to get to this VNet. And as, as you remember, this is what we wanted. Do this for both regions. Again, cool. Now the branches know how do we get to a VNet. But remember, we also wanted to have the VNets go to the branches. It's bidirectional. So what do we do next is we associate, or sorry, we propagate the routes from the branches in both regions to that custom uh, routing table for the VNets. And that's how the VNets know how to get to the branches. And as you might have noticed, there is no propagation of, of routes for the VNets, which means that these VNets cannot talk to each other. We've isolated them. That's basically how it went. To make it a bit more complex, especially in line drawing, let's look at this scenario. It's similar, but here we want to isolate the red VNets from the blue VNets, but they have to be able to reach each other. So we basically have the same scenario with a difference. So instead of every VNet being isolated from everyone, <coughs> I'm sorry, we want to isolate the red ones from the blue ones. So we do this again by creating two custom route tables, one for the blue VNet connections and one for the red VNet connections. And then we play with the propagation. So let's, let's, uh, let's do that. As you can see now, we propagate only the default and the blue, which means that the blue will only be able to talk to the blue and the red will only be able to talk to the red while still being able to go to the branches. And as the, the, the default route table gets all the routes propagated, it can talk to all the VNets. And it's the same deal. Branches to branches in both directions. Branches to VNet in both directions. Red VNet to red VNet, blue VNets to blue VNets, nothing else. So let's go. Default route table. Again, associate the branch offices, the routing associate them to the default route table. Propagate the routes into the default route table. Again, at this moment, branches to branches is taken care of. Next, custom red table. Right? What do we do here? We associate the red uh, VNets with this routing table. Cool. We propagate the blue and the red routes all into the default route table, which means that the branches now know how to get to the red and the blue VNets. But as the red ones at the moment are still only propagated to the, the custom table, sorry, associated to the custom table, nothing is propagated here yet. So they can't talk to each other yet. What do we need to do? First of all, we need to propagate the branch office routes into that custom routing table. So now at this moment, the red ones can already talk to the branch offices. Cool. But last but not least, red had to be able to talk to red and only red. So what do we do? We propagate those routes into the red routing table. So now these red VNets can talk to each other. And basically for the blue ones, you just create a new table where you do exactly the same. You associate your uh, uh, blue VNets to the blue routing table, you propagate your branch offices routes, and you propagate the blue routes now to the blue VNet route table, and now these can talk to each other, and the branches, and the branches can talk to them. And that's the concept of association and propagation with those custom routes. And you can do really funny and funky stuff with it. Uh, another example here, if you want to integrate it uh, with, uh, with the Azure Firewall, right? With the secure virtual hub. So let's play with this. Uh, VNet to VNet. 
they have to be able to talk to each other directly. So VNet has to be able to talk to the VNet. Okay, let's do this. Branch to branch. So the branches have to be able to talk to other branches, users to branches, branches to express route circuits and data centers. Okay, that has to be allowed. So anything else you want to go uh, over the firewall. So if the VNet wants to talk to a branch, it has to go over the firewall. If somebody wants to talk to the, the internet in the VNet, it has to go over the firewall. So what do you do? Well, if you look at the custom routing table here and the default routing table, you're going to create a custom routing table where you associate your VNets with it and you propagate your VNets in there. And that's what you see here. So this means that the VNets can talk to each other. You then add a route to the internet, basically to everywhere. Anywhere else you want to go, go to the Azure Firewall. So we're sending them to the Azure Firewall. And in the default route table, of course, we need to make sure that somebody knows where to go if you want to go to the VNets. And that's what you do with this little construct. This, this actually aggregates both of these subnets. Right, these are 24s, these are, uh, this is 16. So these are both in there. So by putting the Azure Firewall resource in, in ID in here for the VNets, hey, if you want to go to the VNet, that's how, that's how you need to do it. And the branches, again, are connected and associated uh, uh, with, uh, with the default route, and they propagate to the default route. So they know where to go. And that's basically how you do it. These can talk directly to each other. These can talk directly to each other. But the moment uh, there is VNet to branch or internet uh, traffic, it has to pass over the firewall. And you can you know, invent dozens of scenarios that uh, take care of this for you. And uh, you can mix and match to uh, do whatever you want and to apply apply to the rules that the security officers lay down or business units lay down. Maybe you want to separate human resources from everybody, research and development, finance. I don't know, take your pick, however your, your business is organized and whatever legal and other uh, requirements or policies that are in place, you can match them. And then you still, you can add third party routing devices, you can add third-party services into the mix. So it's really a vast uh, mix and match of different technologies you can use to create whatever you need to. Uh, that was the presentation. There's a lot more to say about the firewall. There's a lot more to do with the routing. But uh, in the interest of time, uh, those are separate presentations, so to speak. Uh, thank you for attending. Remember to stay safe so we can all meet up again pretty soon. And if there are any questions or answers, I have some more slides if necessary to go into something deeper if, if needed. But otherwise, I will ask Carson if there are any questions from the audience. Yeah, hi Didier. So uh, I'm a bit blown away. Um, and I know IPv4 routing and firewalling and so on. So for me, it seems cool stuff, but quite, it's still quite complex, right? It's you have to think about well, a lot of it. Well, it's, it's, it's a lot less complex than if you have to do all the pairing manually. Yeah. But of course, the moment you start routing and blocking things, you have to draw it out. Yeah. 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 So for, and that's, that's what I. Yeah. Yeah. So for the audience, any questions here? So you are quite a, a, a quite, quite audience this time. So don't be shy. You can an, an, ask your questions in German. I will translate them if you have. Or are you also blown away? If you are blown away, please tell me in the question part. <laughs> or is nobody there anymore? I have still uh, 73 attendees. We uh, Some dropped out, but there were over 90, but uh, it's hard stuff. So I'll be there. <laughs> Great presentation. Thanks, guys. So. Um, Haha, uh -huh. to be honest, Didier's knowledge exceeds mine so much to such a degree, my questions would seem a bit stupid. There are no stupid questions. No stupid questions. You mean, I, I spent some time diving into this to, to, to wrap my head around it. Yeah. And that's what you have to do with everything. I mean, uh, it, it, the concept by itself is easy, but you have to play with it to really understand it. Uh, and then when the firewall and the router comes into place, 
uh, if you find it difficult, I mean, if you've played with Azure Firewall or with firewalls in general or load balancers or routing devices, they all have their little quirks and special, yeah. let's say, needs and, and, and ways of doing things. But the principles are there. And in, in those custom routing tables, they're there as well. And I think the main the main thing that I wanted to demonstrate is how, how the concept works, how you can create isolated environments and still have some connectivity or push certain types of network over a firewall or not. Uh, it's because that will be the reality, because the any to any, as much as I love it, in reality, somebody will complain about it. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's, that's how it is. So I, I want, the micro segmentation yeah, yeah, I, is still there. I have a question here from a from attendee, and also I want to add. Didier has written a nice blog post about this stuff uh, recently. So you find that on his uh, um, blog. It's it's called uh, working in it dot info, right, Didier? Didier, are you there? You've fallen on your microphone again. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm just astounded <laughs> that you that you don't know my blog, really, <laughs> Carsten. No, it's it's working hard in IT. Yeah. Uh, dot info. Dot work. Dot work. Working hard in IT. Dot work. Oh, I got that work wrong. Yeah. Sorry, my friend. It is. It is on the slide. It is on the, on slide. the slides. Don't okay. worry. The slides. Uh, the presentation the will be available afterwards. You will. You will get a mail, and it it will be in the webinar archive. So I have a question here. Um, is it possible to apply routes based on the username or mobile uh, of a mobile workers? So maybe uh, you want to assign special firewall routes or routes for uh, some workers. workers. From what I from what I have seen in, in in the native capabilities of Azure, I have not seen it. Bar what you can do with uh, user VPNs. Yeah. But there is this, remember we mentioned the third-party services for things like VDI or, or certain SaaS solutions. Uh, possibly those partners might be able to do what you need. That's the reason why they exist. But I haven't, I haven't played or looked at uh, Bar connecting a, a laptop to, to virtual one uh, into the, the, the more, let's say, niche or the more specialized requests. So I think it might be a third-party solution only for the moment. And that's maybe also something I should mention. This is evolving every month or every two or three months. Like every Azure service. So, right? Yes. So something that is not possible now uh, uh, might be possible in, in three months or six months. It's hard to say. But I haven't come across that one yet. No. Yeah. This is actually pretty new for me as well. Okay. Then another question, perfect. Can I integrate, uh, for example, MicroTIC from my data center to Azure Virtual One? I have seen that I can use IPsec IKEY EV2. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Short answer, I love you can. that. The, 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 only, the only thing you need to watch out for is with certain devices, I've noticed that the active-active tunnel, the tunnels always seem to come up, both of them. But for some reason, the routing from Azure to both tunnels sometimes only comes over to one of the from the to one of the tunnels of your connection. So that means that uh, connectivity sometimes is a bit flaky. The way around that is to disable one of the the, the tunnels on your uh, appliance in your data center or at home, and then it works flawless. But you don't have the the failover. Yeah. Right. But but I think maybe when when new firmware comes out or whatever in the future that will all be fixed. I've just noticed that with some appliances you have a li some little quirks, and with some like the ones that are on the on the partner list that integrate with it and automate parts of the configuration, things seem to be a lot better. Okay, next question. So I'm I'm pretty sure you'll get it to work, but perhaps not the active active tunnel. You need to test that one. Second question from the same attendee. Uh, also, can I use OSPF? So the the routing. Uh, I don't think so. It's BGP. It's all BGP. It's BGP. Right? Okay. It's it's Azure is BGP. Yeah. Then I have another question here. Um, a firewall is next gen firewall, and it's app aware, right? I don't think so. Uh, which which fire which firewall? The Azure firewall. Azure firewall. Uh, app aware. I think it's Not a layer four actually. firewall, right? IP, uh... Yeah, if you want app awareness, as far as I know, you are third-party oh, integrations. La it's layer three. IP is layer three. 
it's but you if you, the app aware part is it depends a bit on what you mean with app aware do you do you need app aware for let's say uh checking checking whether a service is online do you, do you want to go the route of the application gateway or the load balancing what 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 in, what is application aware in this context? So, uh, Edin, maybe I... you can clarify a bit uh, the question. I have another one before. Uh, isn't that a software firewall thing? Trevor is asking, <laughs> what is not is a software firewall thing? The question is, uh, does it, um, for example, I think AppAware, as far as I know, if you do Citrix, for example, it recognizes all, all sub-protocols and what ports to open and so on but I've 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 not doing a lot of firewalling in, in, in the last years so here's the question is that a software firewall thing again did you have you an answer for that question is it isn't that uh, what is a firewall, well, I, what, software what, firewall thing? what we, so is is the Azure firewall a software firewall yes yes does that make it application aware? No. Depends on how you define that. Yeah. So are there more are there more questions, my friends? If not, we will call it a day. So last chance to ask your question. No questions anymore. So uh, Didier, I want to thank you uh, for the nice webinar. Um, it was very detailed a lot of information um, the recording will be available soon and we will publish the recording i think on your blog and on my blog because uh, um, that people can re-watch it multiple times <laughs> okay Didi. and if and if there is and if there is an interest in in, in let's say more information about firewalling or that routing uh, let's say the custom routing I'm, I can only always put together more presentations as we are diving deeper into the technology. Yeah. So we can share more in the future, that's for sure. That's cool. So thank you, Didier. Thank, thanks all the attendees. Uh, have a nice one. And the next webinar will be on pure on-premises with, with a little bit Azure. Only a little bit. Bye. A little bit. Bye-bye. <laughs>